Today we are back in the book of Mark. We're going to take the second half of chapter 12. Jesus, during what we understand in, in the church as Holy Week, this is the last week of Jesus's <laughs> earthly ministry. And he's in Jerusalem. He's come in and we've seen him come in and all of the confrontations he had. During this week, they would inspect the lambs that would come for the, the, the day of sacrifice to make sure that the lambs were in perfect shape, that there was no abnormalities, there was nothing wrong with the lamb. Somebody wasn't trying to just get rid of a, you know, uh, the runt of the litter on a sacrifice. And the same thing's happening with Jesus in this week. He's being tested and he's being looked at, and he's being asked questions. And the high priest and all of the, the uh, Levites are assaulting him with all sorts of impossible questions. So we saw part of that last week, and this week we're going to look at the second half of it. So this week it's going to be Jesus Strikes Back, kind of like the Empire Strikes Back. But Jesus is going to strike back at them at all of their questions. So we'll pick it up from the top. So previously we looked at Jesus speaking to them. Jesus told them a parable, which you can find in the book of Isaiah as well, a picture of a vineyard, which was given to those who were to take care of it. And then the owner of the vineyard went there to try to extract payments from what they, the fruit that they made. And uh, there's a whole series of one was beaten, the next was beaten, one was killed. And Jesus is talking about all of the prophets that get sent to the Jewish people. If you look at um, Stephen, the deacon, if you look at Stephen's sermon in the book of Acts, it's an amazing thing. He concludes, after he gives them a long history of their people's history, he goes, you hard of heart and uncircumcised because... God is always sending to you a messenger and you always harden your heart to the Holy Spirit. It's uh, quite an indictment. Jesus is doing something very similar here with the Pharisees and straightening them out. You notice Jesus never had any problem with common sinners. He always had trouble with people that were prideful. The rich young ruler who came up thought he had it licked, thought he was getting into heaven because he was so good. He even called Jesus good teacher, and Jesus kind of checked him on that. So Jesus is being checked by these guys. That's a hockey term. That's when somebody yeah, that's right. body checks you. So that's what they're doing. We looked at paying taxes, whether we should pay taxes or not. Jesus gives this great, great statement, as, as though that would be so surprising. Uh, he was asked, should we pay taxes or not? And he says, well, do you happen to have a denarius? And it was like, yeah, I got one right here. Whoa, wait a minute, we're inside the temple gates and you're not supposed to have that stuff because there's a graven image on that money. And that's why they had money changers. You're supposed to change that money out so that you don't have a graven image in your pocket. And here's again, should we pay taxes or not? Well, let me see a denarius. Oh, okay, I got one in my pocket. A little surprising that they would have something like that. And he says, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. That's his picture on the front. And render unto God what is God's. And what is God's? You are. All of you. His image should be imprinted on you, and you should be carrying his image everywhere. So we talked about taxes. He asked, they were asked about the resurrection from a bunch of people who didn't believe in the resurrection. You know when people come up and they have a question, but they already have an answer formulated? Jesus, there was a man, he married a woman, he died, he didn't leave any children, and so the law says that the next oldest is to marry her and raise up children in his name so they don't lose property and, and all of that, and he died, and then the third brother died, and then the fourth, all the way to the seventh, and they all died. In heaven, in the resurrection, which they're asking the question, not believing in it, whose wife will she be? They were trying to get Jesus cornered into saying, the resurrection is a ridiculous idea. And Jesus said, am I right in saying that you're ignorant? And neither do you know the power of God, nor God's word. And so he explains and goes over it. And he says, when God introduced himself to Moses, he says, I am the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. So, you're wrong. 
he basically squared them off. And you see these different groups of people coming with their own precognitions of what they hold fast to, and Jesus is just exploding it. And he's explaining to them what the scriptures actually teach. And so this is what he's doing this week. As we move on to chapter 12, this week Jesus is going to strike back, and he's going to strike back hard. We have a couple of uh, extra verses here from the book of Matthew to give us a background. What we're going to go over is Jesus' favorite verse. You know what Jesus' favorite verse is? You know what his favorite color is? <laughs> I, I can't I, I can't help but to remember Buddy you know, picking up the phone. Hi, this is Buddy. What's your favorite color? Uh, Jesus actually has a favorite verse, and he's asked about it, and he's quizzed on it, and people presuming to have an argument with him. Second of all, Jesus is going to ask them a question. Hey, you scribes, the scribes, by the way, they were the lawyers. They were experts in the law. They were the ones who copied word for word down everything that was so they would have copies. Aren't you glad they have copies? Xerox copiers and stuff now, but they would have to write it down. So these guys were very, very sharp and they knew it. And Jesus is going to ask them, what's up with David calling his son Lord? You guys got an answer for that one? Since you're asking me questions, I figured I'd ask you one. And, they, and, and none of them say anything. And then there's this warning against acting. You guys know what acting is? Did you ever go on a first date? <laughs> you go on a first date, you men, I know you were clean. I know your fingernails were clean. I know you did whatever you could to make sure you didn't give it off, off any odoriferous scents. <laughs> and it's almost like you're pretending to be something you're not. Soap actually removes the real deal and gives you an artificial thing, doesn't it? In fact, most things in the world around us contemplate this, are there to make things look like what they're not. <laughs> most things in this world are made so that the things that are being used on don't look like they really look. Ladies' makeup, clothing, paint, shingles, I, I go through the list. All of these things, so when you get your hair cut a certain way to complement your face and your figure, all of these things to make it look like what it's not. That's the world we live in. Isn't it funny? And Jesus warns us about falling into this plot, and it's a plot against your soul, to pretend to be something you're not, or to pretend to be something more than you are or to get so hung up on yourself that you think you're the center of the universe. So Jesus talks to the Pharisees about this, and then he talks about giving. Yes, the pastor's gonna talk about giving. They're probably gonna pass three plates. No, no, as you know, we never pass a plate, and I don't plan on that ever changing. Um, giving is something that we do between us and God, and it's something that we should do in secret. It's, in fact, your left hand shouldn't even know what your right hand's doing. Try to work that one out. And so we have a couple of boxes over there, and, and people are slipping things in there. And I would hope that nobody's sitting there staring at the box. <laughs> but, you know, we're human beings, and we tend to get that way, don't we? We tend to get very judgy. And usually it's when we fall short. Because when we're walking right, we don't look at people with that spirit because we're living in grace. And so we tend to give it. So Jesus is going to talk about this. Jesus' favorite verse. Verse 28. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, he asked him, which is the first commandment of all? In other words, the, the greatest commandment. And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You may know that from Deuteronomy 6.4. It's called the Shema. And Jesus doesn't stop there. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And so the scribe said to him, well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth. For there is one God and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the soul and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And then Jesus saw that he answered wisely and he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. I think that was an interesting concept. I, I like to pretend that I'm a studier of human behavior. I had psychology when I was in Bible college and philosophy, and I tend to have my mind formatted around that. It sounds like a very interesting confrontation, but Jesus handles it. And did you notice that the guy repeats everything Jesus just said? You know, teacher, I think you're right. Almost like he's taking credit for the statement. And he repeats almost verbatim exactly what Jesus just said. Lord, I, I, I think you're right there, Jesus. I think you've got something. Yeah. There's one God. Got it. And heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yes, yes. Uh, certainly there's nothing greater than that. That's what I just said. I don't know if, anyway, it, it might be me. I, so one of the scribes, now you have to know the scribes know the scriptures very, very well. And so they saw that the Pharisees bombed out earlier and they were like, ooh, they struck out. It's my turn at bat. I'm going to see if I can stump him. And they get up to the plate to stump Jesus. And that's what this is. It's just a constant parade of people trying to challenge his authority. And so he's asked the question. It's from Deuteronomy 6.4 which goes, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. You notice a slight variant? And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down. And when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, which means it should guide everything you do work-wise. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, which means it's something you're always concentrating on and thinking about and, you know, ruminating on. And the Pharisees took this to a, a very strong degree and put boxes that they would put prayers in, and they're called phylacteries. And they would tie them up on their arm and they would put all these prayers and things in these boxes. And then they would put a headband on with one. And if you saw a guy with a big one, you know, like the whole Old Testament was in there. You knew, you know, that guy was, had either strong neck or he was very showy. And see, what they did is they took these things that the scripture was trying to intonate in a spiritual sense, and they put it into a physical sense, which means their hearts didn't necessarily need to do it. They just needed to dress up with the right stuff. We can get that way. We can come to church and get all dressed up and showered up and haircut and trim my nails and make sure my breath is good. And my heart isn't there. It's a tendency. And uh, unfortunately, the church has a, rec a uh, reputation for that. We need to change it. Amen? Amen? You shall bind them as a sign in your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Jesus says you should take, or I'm sorry, God said in the Old Testament, take the scriptures and let them permeate every aspect of your life so you don't forget them. Any of you have trouble forgetting? I don't have any trouble forgetting. I have trouble remembering. So it was a trick, well, I'm sorry. You, you don't trust me anymore, ever. Forgetting is something that we do and the Lord knows that. And it's something that should, the scriptures should be guiding our conversation. And yet sometimes we get together and we talk about the stupidest things. 
I do. I'm confessing. And so Jesus said the most important thing to do is this. It's interesting. He didn't go to the Ten Commandments. He didn't go somewhere else. He went here. So if you were to sum it up, the most important thing that God tells us we need to do is one word, love. Love? I thought religion was about a bunch of regulations and don't do's and do's and, and uh, you know, standing up and sitting down and, you know, doing all these things. I thought that's what it was. No. It's about loving God with everything that you are, your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Your heart is the seat of your emotions. It's, it, it's where, where you have desires that pour out of. It's what develops into uh, the trajectory of your life is your heart. And we're told to guard our heart because it's the wellspring of life. You get something in your heart. You get your eyes set on something that you're not supposed to have. And it won't be long until you go and try to have it. So we love God with our heart. It's the first thing, by the way, on the list. With all your soul. That's your personality, by the way. That's the thing that is uniquely you. That is different than anybody else. So how can you God love God with your soul? It means that you don't try to be somebody else. If you noticed, I'm kind of a knucklehead. <laughs> and I don't have a problem letting you know that. I slip up all the time. I say foolish things. That's intentional. Because I could put, I could put on the radio voice <laughs> and I could say impactful things in ways that are acceptable <laughs> and dramatic. And yet if the Spirit of God is not working, it doesn't matter what I do. And like Paul, I'd rather speak five words in the church than 10,000 words in a tongue. I'd much rather speak five intelligible words that the Holy Spirit can take and put into your soul than to put on a performance. Amen. Make sense? Yep. So how do you love God with your soul? You be yourself. Don't try to be squashed into the world's mold. Don't try to be like somebody else. You know, we have elders here that teach. You know, they don't teach like I do. They teach like they do, because that's how they love God with their soul. They're individuals. We have people that do all sorts of things, and it doesn't need to be like any one person. It needs to be like God's called you to be, because if you are going to be somebody that you're not, who's going to be you? If God created you to be you, I used to think I'd have to be like Charles Stanley. Now listen, <laughs> I thought I'd have to be like John MacArthur or like John Piper or like uh, Billy Graham, or like, you know, being a pastor, you, you emulate these people and you say, wow, they're so learned. And so, you know, that must be the way to roll it out, you know, and un uh, unless you get a real charismatic guy and it's like, hallelujah, you know, <laughs> and then, you know, I got to be like that guy. And, and it's almost like Bible colleges, you know, punched them out so that they're just like the teacher whose name is on the college. How do you love God with your soul if you're being someone else? Be you. God created you unique with a bunch of experiences and background, and it's twisted some of it, but God will use it. God will use you in your twistedness. Amen. <laughs> Love God with all your soul, with all your mind. What do you think about? You know, what you begin thinking about, you eventually have a desire for, and it will activate the will, and you end up going and doing it. So if you're honoring God with your thoughts, you know, complaining is a sin. <gasps> I can't believe he said that. Yes, complaining is a sin. And there were people in the Old Testament that died because of it, because they complained. Because who do you complain against? Oh, it's so hot outside. <laughs> Winter's coming, don't worry. Ah, but I hate the snow. I hate. <laughs> Who brought that? Who brings the sun? Who brings the snow? So why can't you say thank you? <laughs> but I'm so old, I can't do the things I used to do. That's so you don't get too settled in this world.
because if, if you were healthy and bright until you were 2,000 years old, you wouldn't want to leave. <laughs> Things wear out, right? <laughs> tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. <laughs> Things wear out to the point where you got nothing left and then the Lord takes us home. That's the normal process. <laughs> Love God with all your mind, which means I'm going to get my mind in line with the Lord's. So what does he think? Well, there's this wonderful little verse in Philippians that tells us how we should think and what we should think about. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. There are all sorts of things, and the Lord guides us and directs us and shows us how to love him in a responsive way that's edifying to us. And by the way, when we do the things the Lord's programmed us to do, we're way better off. So loving the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your mind and what you think about, what you set your mind on, your goals, and all your strength. You ever have somebody come to you for counsel and say, you know, Pastor, I'm, I'm wondering what to do. I got this thing and, well, you know, you should try this. I tried that. Oh, did you? Okay. Well, here, let me give you another one. I tried that. Okay. Well, have you, I tried that too. Oh, okay. I guess you're done. You're stuck. Sucks to be you. <laughs> Love the Lord your God with all your strength. I tried it once. It's not that. Well, you know, I'm just always going to gamble, Pastor. You know, it's just the way it is. You know, my whole paycheck every week, I, I just, it's just going to be that way. I'm always going to be addicted to my phone. It's just going to be that way. All your strength? Are you doing all your strength? All your strength, really? Does God expect all your strength? What do we give him? I tried it once. You wonder how I know these things. I haven't been spying on you and nobody's talking about you because it's in me. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's easy. <laughs> Have you looked around at your neighbor? <laughs> By the way, love is a deep commitment to another's best good. It's not what happens in February. It doesn't involve, you know, little naked children with wings. Love is none of that. Love is a deep commitment to another's best good, which means if you love God, you're going to have a deep commitment to what he wants. That's what it is to love God. It's not to be, I love, 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 love. <laughs> it's not an emotional outburst. It involves emotion, but that's not the engine. That's the caboose. Feeling is a wonderful caboose. It's a terrible engine. It will run your life into the hell. I mean, straight to hell. But loving the Lord God means that I have a deep commitment to his best good, which means if you need to be told something, I'm going to tell you because I'm more committed to him than I am you. Amen. It makes it much easier to risk a relationship to tell the truth, right. doesn't it? Yeah. And we do that because we love him with our heart, with our soul, with our mind, and all of our strength. A deep commitment to another's best good. That's the best thing I've found. And by the way, if you insert that into 1 Corinthians 13, you'll see love suffers long. It's not a feeling. In fact, it's kind of a rotten feeling, isn't it? Suffering. Long. Love suffers long and is kind. It does not envy. Love does not parade itself. In other words, it's not about you. It's not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own, is not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity. Ha, ha, ha. They did that thing and, oh, they fell down on their face. They deserve it. Well, that, that's a horrible thing to rejoice about. But it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. Well, not all things, you know, just a lot of things. No, all things. Bears all things, believes all things. In other words, you trust that God can make anybody change and hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. 
It's holding on to, do, to being obedient to God. Number one is to love him with all we have. And it's, we all would say, amen, brother. That's right. That's right. But then shouldn't we see that in the way we live? It's so easy to study something and say, yep, yep, that's good. That's right. Jesus, I believe. Yep, it's certainly that's the, the best answer I ever heard, Jesus. Yep, love God with your heart, soul, mind. Well, how are you doing with that? Since it's the most important thing and everything else is less than that, how are you doing with that? It's very quiet in here. Jesus demonstrates his love for us because he had a deep commitment to our best good to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus demonstrates love. He says there's no greater love than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. And then he went and did it. So I don't know about you, but I can do better. You? But that's not all. Jesus adds to this, and he says, and the second most important one, they only asked a question about what the most important one is, and Jesus is going to add to it because he thinks it's important, and it kind of hinges, doesn't it? And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Do you guys love yourself? Yeah. Oh, yes. I know, I know you do. You have a deep commitment to your best good. I know you do. That's why you wash, that's why you eat, that's why you save money, that's why you buy the things you buy and wear the things you wear and go where you go and have the friends that you have. It's all in your best interest, is it not? It's assumed. You don't have to love yourself. You know, the world says, love yourself. I got a magazine, it's called Self. <laughs> I'd rather look at Jesus, how about you? I'm tired of looking at me. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, you take care of yourself. You buy a meal for yourself, and it's like your favorite food. A natural heart of love would say, man, I got to share this with you. It's the best thing. And a potluck's a great place to do that. Say, I, I, oh, this is awesome. My wife makes an awesome ambrosia. And so if she doesn't do it, I'll have to, but she might. And you want to naturally share those things, don't you? Because you love your neighbor as you love yourself. You want to share that experience. You want to share that joy with somebody else, right? I know you do. Come on. I know you're loving people. You love yourself first, and then you can love other people. It's already assumed you love yourself. So don't concentrate on that. It just makes you the center of the world. There's no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, well said, teacher. Uh, like Jesus needs your authorization. You have spoken the truth, and there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart and all the understanding and all the soul and with the strength is to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than the whole of burnt offerings and sacrifices. Did he really need to say all that? It seems a little pretentious. Jesus answered and gave him his answer, and he's like, well, yes, Lord, I agree with you. I think that's fantastic. Don't you think so? Dude, calm down. We all heard. But the funny thing is he was going to stump Jesus, and finally he realized Jesus is right. I'm trying to trip up somebody who's saying all the right things and doing all the right things. Something happened inside that man. And he responded accordingly. And he says, it's more important than all the birth, burnt offerings and sacrifices. You have to realize they're there to f when they're going to have Passover and they're going to sacrifice all these lambs. And that's why they're all there. It's a, it's a one week wild, you know, living together thing where they're going to have a sacrifice. And that's the whole center of it. And Jesus is saying, you know, what's more important than that, that you love God and that you love your neighbor. And he's coming to a realization, you know, you're right. Those are the more important things. Do you ever get sidetracked? I don't know about you, but I, I've like been busy getting to church. <laughs> and there's somebody stuck on the side of the road. And you go, oh, there's somebody stuck on the side of the road. Lord, help him. I don't want to be late. <laughs> Wait a minute. Because I'll tell you what, I don't ever want to be late. I come here before all of you, just so I'm not late. 
sometimes we make punctuality the God and we forget about people. Sometimes projects become the focus instead of people. You know how that is? Like the people that you work with. Pick that up. Pick, no, not that, that. Thank you. And, and you're busy working. And that's the way you talk to somebody when you need a tool? That's because the project is more important than the person. Somebody at work, I can't believe you're late again. Like, wait a minute. Is the project more important or are the people more important? If the people are more important, you should speak to them lovingly. Truth, give them truth, 100%. But give it to them in love. Because projects are nowhere near as important as people. And he says, you're right. Jesus, it's more important to love God with everything you have and to love your neighbors yourself. It's more than all the sacrifices and going through all this stuff that we get so hung up on. Your personal relationship with Jesus Christ is more important than coming to church. <gasps> Did he say that? Yeah, I said that. If you think this is your personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you're anemic. Philippians 2, verses 3 to 5 says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. By the way, that's the term for humility. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to speak that very famous passage about how he didn't think equality with God was something to be grasped or held on to, but he emptied himself and being found in the form of a man, he humbled himself even to death on the cross. But it says you should have this mind that Jesus had. Jesus had this mind. He was thinking about us when he went and died on the cross. He was even praying for the people killing him. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus asks us to follow him and do that very same thing. And with the spirit of God inside of us, we can do it. That's what he created us for. It's about relationship over ritual, over religion, and over this public piety about the show on the outside. It's more important that it's authentic and it comes from a clean heart. Amen? Amen. And so it says, but after that, no one dared question him. <laughs> <laughs> what it was is all of his critics who had gathered around and the Pharisees came and the scribes came and the Sadducees, he leveled the Sadducees with that resurrection thing. All of the different groups that all had all their own little political agenda with Jesus, he knocked them all out, and that was it. They weren't going to ask him any more questions. I find that interesting. They got to the point where they're like, we just got to kill this guy. That's what they did. Jesus now going to ask them a question about David, who's one of their favorite characters. They love to associate with all of their forefathers because they're great examples in some ways. In verse 35, Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, how is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? By the way, the scribes, the guys that knew the word for word translation extremely well. And they say, why is the Christ the son of David? Why do they say that? And then he asks in verse 36, for David himself said, by the Holy Spirit, so you can't discount it and say that he didn't mean it. The Lord said to my Lord, well, wait a minute, there's two different Lords here. This sounds a little uh, strange. The Lord, Yahweh, said to my Lord, Adonai, which are both words for God, by the way. The Lord said to the Lord, what, what, what's he have, like dual personality? Yes, I think so. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Therefore, David calls him Lord. How then is he his son? And it says the common people heard him gladly because they loved to see Jesus ask them a question that they couldn't answer. How is it that David calls his descendant who would be the Christ Lord? You see, Jesus is trying to introduce who he is to them. 
Well, it doesn't ever say anywhere in the Bible that Jesus said he's God. Well, he referenced this passage, and he's talking about himself. And his name is Adonai, which is a name for God. This comes from Psalm 110. It's not like Jesus didn't know. Like, hey, guys, you know, I've been wondering about this passage. No, he gave to them exactly what they were given to him. Let me give you a question I already know the answer to, but you don't. Except Jesus did know the real answer, and they did not. I love that about Jesus. In John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus claimed very boldly that he is God. I am is the sacred name of God, which was revealed to Moses through the burning bush up on the mountain. I am. Because Moses said, hey, listen, I, 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 I'm, I'm ill-equipped. I can't speak. I really am not your guy. You should pick anybody else, but I'm not him. And he says, I don't even know your name. He says, okay, no problem. I am. Tell them I am sent you. That's interesting. I am means I, I am the one who is, who has always been, who will always be. I am. Transcendent of time and space and matter. I am. And Jesus said, I am. And the Pharisees knew exactly what he was saying, and they picked up stones to stone him because they believed he was blaspheming. And he goes, listen, I've done a bunch of great deeds here. Uh, what are you stoning me for? And he said, oh, not for, it's not for a miracle or a great deed that you did. It's because you claim to be God. They made it very clear what Jesus was saying. He's God the Son. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Amen. Then Jesus is going to warn them. Then he said to them in his teaching, beware of the scribes. These are the guys he's been dealing with who desire to go around in long robes. They love gatherings in the marketplace, the best seats in the synagogues, the be best places at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. It's also mentioned uh, up here. I have the reference for Matthew and for Luke. You know that Mark is kind of condensing everything. It's the shortest of the four Gospels. The other Gospels have the kind of extended version, the uncut director's version of what Jesus said. But he says, you guys are all about the show. You're all show and no go. The scribes desire to have big, long robes. They want to be recognized in public. Jesus goes on in Matthew for 30 six verses talking about woe to you Pharisees you're hypocrites a hypocrite is, a, is an actor we would call them a Hollywood employee <laughs> you're pretending to be something that you're not you're putting on an act and you enjoy the recognition you enjoy the honor and the praise do you understand that this lodges itself in each one of our hearts when we want that, Jesus in Matthew 23 says, Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. In other words, they're your authorities. Therefore, whatever they tell you to do, that you should observe and do. But do not do according to their works. For they say and they do not do. They're bad examples. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they lay them on men's shoulders they themselves will not move them with even one of their fingers. But all their works that they do, they do to be seen of men. They make their phylacteries broad and they enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi, which means teacher. But you do not be called Rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ. He's talking about himself. And you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father. By the way, they were in the midst of calling Abraham their father. And they took a lot of pride in being genetically linked. And that's what he's speaking of. But we understand it means more than that. Do not call anyone on earth your father. For one is your father who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers. For one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. 
And whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Because of their bad teaching, they influence people away from God because they put these heavy burdens. Oh, you've got to do, you've got to do, you've got to do, you've got to do. 613 laws. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses. They would convince women to donate all of their proceeds when they die to them. And they were like little salesmen. For a pretense, you make long prayers because you're showy. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, that's, that's a disciple, and when he is one, you make him twice his son of hell as you are yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, for you say, whoever swears by the temple, it's nothing, but whoever swears by the gold in the temple, well, he's obliged to perform it. That's like saying, if you swear in your mother's grave, then you really mean it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold in the temple and the sac or the sacrifice uh, or the temple that sanctifies the gold. And whoever swears by the altar, it's nothing, but whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he's obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift. Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and all things on it. And he who swears by the temple swears by it and by him. I cut it off. Jesus said, when you say something, you should mean it. You shouldn't have to be swearing on particular things as to whether it's an identifiable, you know, stamp of approval that it's authentic. Everything you should say is done in God's view and you'll be judged for it. So why is it, why is the gold more important than the altar or the, you know, the sacrifice more important than the temple? It's bananas. What you say should be yes or no. Anything beyond that comes from the evil one, we see James tells us. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You neither go into yourselves, nor do you allow those who are going in. He who swears by the temple swears by it, and he who dwells in it, and he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and him who sits on it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You get the common thread through this? You pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, cumin, and you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These guys would take 10% of their garden and make sure they gave it to the church. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. You're walking along and a gnat goes in your mouth. They were so concerned that that little bug may have landed on an unclean animal and now it's in their mouth and it makes them unclean. But they had no problem sneaking outside the Jerusalem walls and buying some mystery meat from a vendor on the side of the road. And they would, they would put camel meat on there. And so they had no problem. They just didn't ask him what kind of meat it was. So you got no problem swallowing camel. But if a gnat gets in your mouth, you're going to freak out and make a big show. Oh, I'm unclean, unclean. You get the idea? It's for a show. Lord, help us never to be on a show. Help us to be authentic and real before you. That's what it is to love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor is yourself. Anyway, Jesus goes on to condemn them in Matthew. So if you want the longer version, you can read the rest of Matthew in chapter 23. Jesus gives us this classic example of why we should be careful of this pageantry of pretending. In Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14, also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. I love the commentary. You know exactly the meaning of why Jesus is going to tell this story and despised others. Two men went to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Jesus said, Pharisee goes in, he goes to pray and he is praying 
all by himself. God is not involved. He's not present. He's not talking to God. He's making a commercial for himself. He prayed with himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, like God doesn't know this. I give tithes of all that I possess. Who are we saying that for? Everyone listening. Because it's not silent. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as even raise his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus then speaking says, I tell you this, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. God doesn't want us going up and telling him how good we are. I've been a good boy, Lord. This is all the good stuff I've done. And feeling as though I'm righteous and I have some right to look down on someone else. God does not appreciate that. And Jesus tells this parable, this story it may have actually happened. But this is what they've been doing all along in their hearts. And Jesus is now going to comment on giving. Verse 41, now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and he saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who were rich put in much. And then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrans. Uh, by the way, two mites are the smallest denomination. It's actually one eighth of a penny. We don't even have anything that small. So she's got two of them. So she's got a, a quarter of a penny. And a, quadra, a quadrants, by the way, is Roman money. So Mark, being sensitive to his Roman audience, is explaining Jewish money to Roman money, which doesn't help us at all. And so he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty. She put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. There's this wonderful area near Solomon's portico, and there are 13 of these trumpet-looking things. They, they come down like this, and they go into a box down below. Undoubtedly, they're locked up real well, because there are a lot of people in the temple and people would go to these 13 receptacles and they would give money. And they would give money with lots of pageantry and sound and, you know, you can picture somebody coming with a big duffel bag of ones and stuffing it into this big trumpeted looking thing. And This woman walks up with two eighths of a penny and she puts it in. People used to just bring a lot of coins because they would make sound, which would attract attention. And so they'd be like, psh, psh, psh. Well, that guy's really there. Get a line behind you, more people to watch you. And Jesus said, you see that widow? She gave more than everybody else because that may have been contributed towards her eating today. That's all she had. God doesn't look at us on a scale of amount. Well, I, I gave more than everybody else. Oh, yeah? Well, you have more than everybody else, so it makes sense, <laughs> right? It's not about your portion, it's about your proportion. You see, if, to him who much is given, much is required, God says. Jesus said that. Just a little trivia for you. One out of every seven verses in the New Testament talks about money. 
You'll remember that one, I'm sure. What did you talk about at church? Like money. <laughs> did you know that one out of every... Yeah, I, I, it's one of those things you'll leave with. Why is that such a topic? Because money is a reflection of where your heart is. The benefit of giving is that the power of that stuff gets separated from you. That's the power of giving. When you give and you know that you're doing it to the Lord and you're doing it for the right reasons, when you give, whether it's of your time, whether it's of your abilities, your talents, or whether it's of your finances, doing it right separates the power of that stuff over your life so that it doesn't tell you what to do, right? That's the benefit of giving. Giving is it loses its power in your life and suddenly you're freer. That's the blessing of giving. And when you're doing that, it shouldn't be loud. It shouldn't be in front of people. It shouldn't be for people to see. See, we could, we could get a bulletin. We should put what everyone gave. You know some churches do that? I'm not sure Jesus would be happy walking in there. So that's what Jesus taught about this widow. By the way, your heart goes where your money goes. I always thought your money went where your heart was. But it says here in Luke 12, 34, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Do you understand wherever it is that you invest your time, your talents, or your finances, that's where your heart will be. So you want to be able to kind of have a barometer or your spiritual barometer? What do you spend money on? Take a look at that list. That's where your heart is. That's where you spend money. So Jesus talks about his favorite verse, the most important verse, which is to love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. We can all mentally say, amen, Jesus. Yeah, we should be doing that. But it's another thing to put it into practice. That's right. And I don't know about you, but I need reminders. I need it to be on the, on the back of my hand and uh, as a front lid between my eyes. And I need it on the doorposts and the lintel of my house. I need to see God's word everywhere. I need to be reminded of it all the time because I tend to fill up with myself. It's like a shower, right? I was clean this morning when I stepped out of the shower. That's how long it lasted. <laughs> David's son. Why is David's son a Lord? Well, it's because he's God incarnate. He's the very son of God. That's why. And the warning against acting and behaving in a way that is exaggerated from really who you are. Be careful that you don't try to put on a performance for other people. And number four, sometimes giving much is way too little because it's not in proportion. It might be large in comparison to the widow who gave a quarter of a penny. But God found her sacrifice to be better. And so if you're poor and you don't have a lot of stuff or a lot of money, you should know that God appreciates whatever it is that you do because it's a larger proportion than some. Amen? Amen. Next week, we plan on meeting back here. Um, we're going to start talking about the end times. Yay. It's coming. <laughs>